Good evening, and welcome to this Rick Steves Tours Festival of Europe and Monday Night Travel crossover event. My name is Julianne Worden, and I will be your moderator this evening as we learn about ethical travel in a warming world with our hosts, Rick Steves and Craig Davidson. And now it is my pleasure, along with about three and a half thousand households, to introduce our one of our hosts for this evening, Rick Steves. Hi, Rick. Julianne, thank you so much. And it's just great to have everybody with us this evening. This is, I believe, evening 15 out of 22 nights in a row that we are celebrating European travel. And every night we've been going to a different destination in Europe. And this night we're going to a place that matters to all those destinations. We're going to be discussing the ethics of travel and climate change and how that relates to our travel dreams. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope that you find this next hour really helpful as we all strive to travel more ethically in a world that has some pretty serious challenges ahead of us. You know, during this festival, we're getting together with our travelers, and we used to do that in person here in Edmonds, just north of Seattle. Every January, we would host a big weekend where a couple thousand people would fly in putting a lot of carbon up into the atmosphere, having a massing of the scrapbooks and celebrating their love of travel. Well, this year we're doing it without having everybody fly all the way to Seattle. We're having our travel festival in a virtual way. A lot more people can enjoy this time together and every night we get together with a different topic. Of course, we're selling tours, but we're also just celebrating travel and people can take our tours or they can just equip themselves with a good guidebook and go over there and do it on their own. But the fun thing is that we can turn our travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality if we make the good choices as we plan our trips. So here you can see the schedule of what we've been doing. <laughs> There's a lot going on. I want to remind you, everything we've done in the last couple of weeks is recorded. And it'll be living right there at ricksteves.com in the travel section. And you can watch any of those episodes you may have missed. You can share this episode, it will live on on our website, and you can sign up for what's coming up in the next week. Tomorrow, it's Steve Smith and France. After that, we're going to Ireland, Germany, Netherlands, Greece, Joy of Italy, and a week from now, we're having our grand finale, and that's just going to be a party. As a matter of fact, I just sent an email today to all 100 people in our staff here, and I invited them over to my house. And they're going to join me, and you're going to have a lot of noise behind me as we just celebrate all of the most fun adventures we've had in Europe, and we're going to be running a lot of video clips that will make that evening a real delight. Put that one on your calendar. Hey, we've got uh, about 40 different itineraries that take 30,000 people around Europe every year, and all of us guides are committed both to giving our travelers a great experience and helping us go home with a better sensitivity about what it means to be a citizen of this planet. And part of that is to be sensitive to global warming. And you know, this is particularly poignant for me right now because two months ago, I became a grandpa for the first time in my life. And I see the joy in my daughter, Jackie, when she holds that bundle of joy and I feel that joy myself. And as a traveler, I recognize that joy. And then I remember there's nothing unique about it. It feels unique to me, but there's, seven billion people or something on this planet and they love to hold their babies and they love to think of the future of their children and they are concerned about where our planet is going as travelers we have a global perspective and we understand that we have a responsibility a stewardship responsibility to if we enjoy the world to do it in a way that minimizes the impact on this planet because this world is filled with beautiful people it's filled with love it's filled with delightful little huggable babies and our little baby we want to leave a climate and we want to leave an environment that is just as vibrant and fertile and filled with fun as what we get to experience today. In fact, here's little Atlas. Jackie's boy, my little grandson, is named Atlas. And we want to be sure that he'll be able to enjoy this world just like I have, just as you have, and just as people have in the past. So today, we're going to be talking about something we're calling our climate smart commitment. And, you know, as a tour operator, I've got to just say, I've got to just take a moment and, and recognize there's a white elephant in the room. Here we are celebrating travel and we're trying to be ethical people and we're contributing to something that is an existential threat to our civilization, 
global warming, climate change. And um, of course, there are some people that just think we should be flight shamed out of our travels. And that is an option. But we want to travel because we believe there's a value in traveling. As a matter of fact, I believe that in the future, the problems that confront us will require the family of nations to work together to solve those problems. And we need to travel to get to know each other. And we need to travel so we can have a better relationship with the other 96% of humanity. That is fundamental to our passion for travel. When we think about what are we going to do with this quandary, what I like to do as a travel teacher and a tour organizer is to encourage and inspire and equip people to travel in a way that's more meaningful so that when they come home, they have a global perspective. And also something we're grappling with as a company is to help people travel in a way where they mitigate the carbon they create when they fly all the way to Europe and travel around and fly home. We want to minimize the impact we have in a negative way on the environment, and we want to maximize the impact we have as individuals. So when we come home, we're not only maybe more thankful to be living where we live, but we are better citizens of this planet. We will travel, and there are ethical issues we need to deal with. So tonight's presentation, I'm going to kick it off, and we're going to talk about why we travel. We we quizzed our Facebook travel and friends and we asked them for ethical issues that they're concerned about. And I'll review some of the ethical issues and beyond climate change, reminding you that this is not to give solutions to those, but it's just to be conversation starters and get us tuned in to the ethics of travel. And then I put together a few slides that show the impact of climate change on Europe already. I wanna review those with you and also explain how Europe is fighting climate change on the continent. And then I want to introduce my friend and COO at our company, Rick Steves Europe, Craig Davidson. And he's got about a 30 minute presentation that explains what we call our climate smart commitment. This is a, essentially a self-imposed carbon tax where we invest about a million dollars a year to create that much good to negate the bad that our 30,000 travelers create when they fly to Europe and back. And we invest that in a portfolio of 10 companies in the developing world, nonprofits that help farmers do their work in a way that contributes less to climate change and helps them be more productive. It's such an exciting program. And Craig has spearheaded that with all the passion and talent he has as our COO. And I'm excited to turn the mic over to Craig in just a few minutes. Uh, then we'll have a Q&A session. And after that, I've got the name of a lucky traveler it's in my money belt right now. And I'm gonna pull that out and I'm gonna share with you the name of the person who wins a free Rick Steves tour at the end of tonight's presentation. So thank you for being with us. And now I wanna just talk you through a few of these images that relate to what we're talking about tonight. We live in the wealthy world. We're privileged people. We've got a lot of power. We've got a lot of opportunities. We've got plenty of money. And a lot of us wanna get out there and have a good time on our vacation traveling around. Well, when we travel around, we can celebrate the world in all its beauty, but we can also travel in a way that broadens our perspective and heightens our sensibilities and sensitivities to challenges facing this planet. And then we go home and as citizens of this most powerful country on the planet, we can make a difference. So we wanna keep on traveling, but we wanna travel in a way where we become a force for good a force for sustainability on this planet. And one powerful byproduct of travel is you realize, especially when you venture beyond the wealthy world, you realize that this world is home to lots of struggling people. The average human being on this planet is trying to live on $5 a day. And that is a norm that is beyond a lot of people's ability to imagine unless they travel. There are a lot of people on this planet who are supposed to be our enemies. When we travel, we get to know our enemies and they get to know us. If ever you wanted to be a powerful force for peace, you could go to places where we're not supposed to go and meet people, let them know what we're about. It makes it tougher for their propaganda to demonize us and we'll learn what they're about. And then it makes it tougher for our propaganda to demonize them. That's making travel a political act. When we travel, we find that there are walls on this planet. There are many walls, metaphorical walls and physical walls on this planet. And if we're going to grapple with these walls, we've got to know the story on both sides of those walls. That's called dual narrative travel. And we are all over dual narrative travel. 
We need to recognize that when we get out, we can understand these kind of problems. We can gain an empathy for the other 96% of humanity, and we can come home with an enthusiasm for building not walls, but building bridges so we can all work together. I like this photograph of a, just a simple little girl sleeping on the overstuffed chair in her family's living room. She could be in Mexico. She could be in Colombia. She could be in Cuba. She could be in Iran. She could be in Russia. She could be in Japan. She could be in Colorado. She happens to be in Iran, but she's got the same dreams and challenges in her society that we have in ours. And one thing you learn when you travel is we all like ice cream. <laughs> we all have so much in common. And that's just a beautiful thing to take home. Now, we asked our travelers for some ethical issues to consider. Climate, our uh, climate is, uh, uh, well, climate is the underlying problem that we'll talk about later, but crowding is a huge problem. I mean, we all these days, uh, people who are able to afford traveling, we have the same dreams. We go to the same places and we crowd cities. We crowd Paris. We crowd Salzburg. We crowd Amsterdam. We crowd Barcelona. We crowd Venice. This can have a negative impact on cities, big and small. We have to be mindful of what kind of impact we have on the places we're visiting. And to remember that we like to leave our vacation dollar in the places where we visit, but a lot of people in these countries and in these destinations, they don't see it that way. They see us first world travelers spending money at international corporations and graffiti like this, which could be anywhere in, in, in the world, really. Graffiti, it happens to be in Portugal, I think, but it could be anywhere. Graffiti like this just says, McDonald's arches, that must mean international corporations equals the eight powerful rich countries equals bad news for locals. Um, this is a dynamic that as travelers, we can exacerbate or we can learn more about and help to uh, 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 fix. Uh, cruising is a huge industry, 3000 tourists on a cruise ship. It's a lot of pollution. It's a lot of stress on local communities. It's also a way that people can travel in an affordable and a safe and economic uh, way. People who don't have very uh, uh, much ability to walk can have accessibility. People that want to travel with three generations can do so. Cruising has its good points and cruising has its bad points. How you deal with that is really an issue that is up to you, but it's worth thinking about. We want to travel in a way that leaves our money in the local community, staying at an internationally owned you know, hotel, doesn't do that. I'll tell you that I like to stay in a family run hotel. Then I know that my money will stay in this community, in this case with the Koch family in the town of Reuter in Austria. A big change in travel lately are short term rentals. Uh, you'd think of Airbnb, for example. Well, these are so fun and so affordable and they make so many things possible for us. But when we go to a short term rental, and we got to realize even every loft these days in popular destinations is turned into an, a rentable space. This drives up the cost of living for local people. And what used to be a charming town, what used to be a charming boulevard, what used to be a charming market is transformed into a place that serves the needs of tourists. And the people on limited uh, incomes who used to live there can no longer afford to live there, and they are sent to the suburbs. A good example of that in Barcelona is the Ramblas. We know and love the Ramblas, but it used to be a real community drag, and now the Ramblas is, it's a tourist ghetto. It's a can-can of little tourist shops. It used to have all the character because local people lived in the apartments surrounding that boulevard. Today, that boulevard is inhabited by tourists and the local people are out in the concrete suburbs. This is an issue. Is it an issue, an ethical issue that you wanna deal with or I wanna deal with? I don't know. It's up to each of us, but we should know that a cute little town in the Alps, if it is turned into a gathering of Airbnb accommodations, that means there's not enough children in that town to have a school and the community dies. We get affordable accommodation and these people no longer have a school in the community for their children. That's an ethical issue that we can think about. I am so into travel as, as a, a reality experience, travel as an education. In fact, I've taken many tours uh, decades ago about traveling in a thoughtful way. There are reality tours and they introduce us to these ideas. What's the impact of our country on the developing world? Is it good? Is it bad? Do we think it's good, but are we duped by propaganda? 
or is it actually money that helps local communities have dignity and develop and be stable? We can learn about that if we choose to in our travels. For me, something very important is to travel with the window down, traveling with a curiosity and a desire to meet local people and to learn what is their reality. We don't know what their reality is unless we travel. These are all reasons to travel, to understand issues exist that we don't even know about, issues that people would die for. In our society, we have these issues, and in other societies, they have their issues. We've got our baggage, they've got their baggage. A lot of times we travel mindful of how we consume shapes of uh, the world. It's a good ethic for us as Americans right here. And a lot of us have certain issues that we are very close to us and we don't wanna travel in a way that encourages the opposite. If you're interested in gay rights, you'll be more comfortable in a town that celebrates gay rights and even has gay couples on the lights for crosswalks. And you might wanna avoid a country that is homophobic where it's actually possibly dangerous for a gay person to travel. This is an ethical issue. Do you factor that into your travels? A lot of people are interested in animal rights. Uh, a big deal in Southern France is to force feed their geese. And uh, for a lot of people, they think this is atrocious. Other people think, hey, that's a very nice pate. Uh, is it good? Is it not? There are cases to be made for both. This is something we need to be mindful of. If you're interested in animal rights, I'm sure you're interested in bullfighting. Is that a brutal sort of tactic or, or festival that is made possible and funded by tourism? Or is it part of the local culture? Well, you can have thoughtful people, caring people that see it both ways. It's a very harsh slice of Spanish culture, but my ethic as a travel writer and tour organizer and tour guide is if there's something that is of questionable ethics that is existing because of the patronage of tourists, then it's an ethical issue on my part, whether or not I should talk about it, report on it, or even promote it. But if it's an issue that is of questionable ethics, that is part of that culture as a travel that with or without tourism, I find in my own ethics that it is okay to go there and okay to talk about it. As soon as it's only around because of tourists, then it becomes an ethical issue for me. Another issue these days after the pandemic or during the pandemic is what kind of responsibilities do we have when it comes to traveling about having a vaccine or having our boosters or if we are sick do we wear a mask do we isolate these are new ethical issues that we didn't have to deal with before that we should factor into our thinking but i want to talk about climate change now because the one overriding existential issue today on this planet whether you're staying home in the united states or traveling around europe is the risk the, the reality of climate change. It is hot where we travel. Public fountains are now swimming pools where people find relief. I do not like to look at the climate chart when I see everything in the 30s and Celsius. And now when I travel north of the Alps in the summer, you can have three weeks in a row where the temperature's in the 90s and that changes the experience. Throughout my lifetime, most of Europe did not need air conditioning. And now people in Scotland and people in Germany, uh, hoteliers and so on, are scrambling to put in air conditioning. This is new. And when we travel, we find that in Europe, energy is quite expensive. And sometimes we don't have the opportunity to warm or cool our room. They don't let us turn on the air conditioning in the spring and the fall. They'll say, just put on a sweater or take off the sweater. Uh, these are issues. And we'll tune into those issues as we travel. But climate change is here from a travel point of view. Countries are seeing it's actually a hazard, a health hazard, a dangerous thing. And they put up new drinking water stations and countries are paying for shade to go over uh, pedestrian streets so people can find relief from the sun when they're walking from shop to shop. And if you have a restaurant in the summer in most of Europe that doesn't have outdoor seating, you might have a very tough time getting any clientele. I've noticed in Europe these days, especially in the north where they didn't used to eat outside a lot. Now eating outside is the standard thing in the summer. And then of course, everybody goes inside when it gets cooler. I was in Lyon in France just a little while ago. I was on the rooftop of the cathedral there in France. And I noticed that the slate tiles had duct tape holding them together. I asked my guide, what's going on? Climate change. It heated up the roof so much that the tiles expanded and cracked, something they have never experienced before. 
Of course, when you go to the Alps, when you go to the mountains of Norway, when you go anywhere where there are glaciers, you'll find glaciers in retreat. Everybody in tourism who used to do glacier tourism now is an environmental activist, it seems, because their livelihood is shrinking as the glacier skedaddles up that valley. If you have a ski resort, you don't build a ski lift now without plumbing it for snowmaking machines. I was hiking in, this, in the Dolomites in Northern Italy, and you find these, uh, uh, these pods that are faucets that sprinkle snow in the winter because Swiss uh, Alpine ski resorts now need help getting snow. Oh, I love the Cinque Terre. But when you look at a little town that for centuries has been nestled in its ravine, and you see the peaceful main drag, you realize now for the first time in their history, they are susceptible to violent weather. That valley that goes up from the ravine on both sides becomes a funnel. And now they get as much rain, but it all comes together. All over the world, we're having rain because of climate change come down in torrents. And what does that mean in Haiti? It washes away the topsoil and people don't have any food. What does that mean on the Mediterranean coast of Italy? On a bad day, you have a flash flood and you have something they've never seen before. Six feet of mud engulfing their entire city. Nobody could live here for a year. Why is that? Why is that violent weather here? Why are we having these once in a century storms every other year? Well, it's because of a warming climate. Venice historically has been right on the waterfront, right at sea level. And every long period of time as the sea rises, they actually take up those stones, lay some more sand and put those same stones down as slowly the ground floor is rising to accommodate the rising sea level of the Mediterranean. This is a good example of climate change right here in Venice, when you have a perfect storm of wind, high tide, barometric pressure and so on, you find the main square filled with water. Hamburg is built on a mighty river in Germany, and they have made an elevated embankment just in the last decade that is landscaped and turned into kind of a park, but it is to keep the city from flooding. And I've noticed the new buildings in Hamburg along the river, the ground floor is now concrete stilts to hold the building up and you've got parking on the ground floor in anticipation of routine floods and all over the coastline of England you find storm barriers put on towns that never used to flood this is the reality the Atlantic Ocean is getting taller and little towns on the south coast of England that never flooded before now they need a storm barrier that can be wheeled in the front there and protect that town from unseasonable high unprecedented high waters the dutch are famously frugal they're spending billions of euros moving sand to bolster their dikes and the netherlands of course most of that land is below sea level reclaimed from the sea now their battle is with the sea and as travelers we see these huge huge uh, investments and mechanisms storm barriers uh, new york and new orleans could use storm barriers uh, rotterdam has a storm barrier and right here, these two uh, semicircles on wheels are the side of two Eiffel Towers on their side. And when there is the risk of a storm, they are wheeled out like this and they protect over a million people from that storm surge. As travelers, we can travel in a way that is more green. Europe is really into this. Are you gonna take a car? Are you gonna take a train? Or are you going to take the plane? Car and plane is tough on the environment. Train is much better. You'll find all over Europe, people are now going to trains. Nobody wants to drive or fly from Madrid to Barcelona. You can take the train. It's fast and it is green. This is a new ethic in Europe, along with an emphasis on public transportation. Many of my friends in Europe never learn to drive. They don't learn to drive because their public transportation is so good. And cities are being designed to be green, to be sustainable in the future. People are using bicycles and downtown zones are favoring bikers over drivers. I was just in Amsterdam. This used to be a busy four lane road. And today there's no cars, no cars at all. There's rails for the tram. There's bike paths and pedestrian paths. And you can hear the birds. The Dutch know how to harness wind power. They're doing it well, as is the rest of Europe, as people understand that we are weaning ourselves from fossil fuel and in our travels 
If we can consume less fossil fuel, we contribute less to climate change. And that's where we're heading right now. We are learning how we as travelers can mitigate our impact on the climate. You know, we've, I mentioned we have this climate smart commitment, self-imposed carbon tax. We're investing a million dollars a year in 10 carefully chosen nonprofits that work in the developing world to help farmers do their work in a way that contributes less to climate change. And we are so excited about the impact of our gifts, our investments in these nonprofits that we want to share it with you. As a tour company, we are very concerned about the ethics of having people travel in a global, in a warming world. We have 30,000 people on our tours, probably have a million people using our guidebooks every year. And I'm really thankful for the work of our COO, Craig Davidson, and I'd love to introduce him now. Uh, Craig, can you join us? Craig, there you go. You've been working so hard on this. About 10 years ago, you joined us as our COO. I was impressed not only by your business smarts, but by your ethics and your passion for the environment. And uh, it must be, uh, it's, it's been quite a challenge. Uh, is our program, Climate Smart Committed, Commitment, ready for prime time, would you say? It is, and I'm ready to show it. All right. Well, Craig Davidson, I'm going to turn it over to you and um, explain to us what we've created and and uh, what it's uh, how its impact has been. Thanks, Craig. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Hello, everybody. Um, I guess the first thing I want to say, and Rick has shown some of this in his presentation tonight, is really when you talk about ethical travels or really ethical anything, it's really about living your values and really what you believe and what you would like to demonstrate. And for us at Rick Steves Europe, I think most of you on this call and this video call know this already, right? We believe travel makes the world a smaller place. It gives you that opportunity to go get a broad perspective by experiencing other cultures and bringing that back home. But as an organization, we don't think the value of travel stops the moment you get on that plane to come home. We actually think that's when the value of travel really kicks in because we believe that you can bring that new perspective back to your community and make it stronger. And for us, that's what we call being a good global citizen. It's understanding you are just a citizen of the world. And there are billions of people out here who share this planet and they all have a unique perspective. And as global citizens, we truly believe at Rick Steves Europe that we wanna treat the community and the earth like a shareholder. And that is giving back. It underlies everything we do at Rick Steves Europe, and it binds us together as a merry band of travelers. As Rick said, you know, there's about 100 people that work for us. There's the big square box on this page where you can see our merry band of travelers. You meet some of them every Monday and through this festival as moderators, but there are a lot of work behind the scenes. And the, that community, our merry band of travelers, gets to pick a lot of our philanthropic activities that the company does because we want it to represent them and where they come from. The top uh, picture on this slide, I think you'll mostly remember that when COVID hit, we couldn't travel. The world shut down for two years and as people committed to traveling, that was hard on us. But instead of shutting down, we actually kept people on the payroll so they could volunteer at our local nonprofits to keep those services strong. And the other picture is Rick and I, I know I'm a little box in your screen right now, so now you get a better picture of me. That's Rick and I with our hard hats on in front of the Edmonds Community Center, where we were a major funder in building that community center. And we're about to break ground on another community center in Linwood because we're just so committed to this idea of building places where the community can come together and share ideas and be involved. Well, of course, Knowing that and being those kind of people, we know that, as Rick said, we know that travel does impact the environment, but we believe in the value of travel so much, we know the solution isn't to stop traveling. That would end that human connection that we think is so important. And so really the solutions about being a global citizen, understanding your values, as well as the problem and the alternatives, and then really just taking accountability for your actions. And honestly, there's not a lot of accountability out there right now. Companies don't take accountability for their actions. Governments aren't requiring it. And accounting standards boards 
aren't telling us, and I'm an accountant by training, what to do about it. And so that's why we really did it ourselves, right? We put that self-imposed carbon tax that Rick talked about so that we could creatively mitigate the cost of our tour members' flights to Europe. And that's our climate smart commitment. And so since 2019, we've donated roughly $30 a tour member. I shouldn't say roughly. It is $30 a tour member to nonprofits that are actively working around the world fighting climate change. Now, $30 a tour member times 30,000 a year gets you to about a million when you round it up. But you can see I have an asterisk beside 2019. And that's because in 2019 with COVID, or 2020 and 2021, because of COVID, we didn't travel. We didn't earn revenue, and therefore there would have been no revenue from that self-imposed carbon tax. But because of the work that these organizations were doing, we didn't want to stop it. We committed to these organizations in 2019 when we started this program, and the work was so important and so impressive that in the years of COVID, we committed to a half a million dollars a year to keep those programs sustainable. So including this year's uh, contribution, we are now up to $3 million in the four years we've been doing this. And this is our core portfolio. It's not every, every organization we donate to, but these are the organizations that have received more than one grant over the course of our program. And we call them our core portfolio. Now, all of these partners in our portfolio live our values. As I said, when you act ethically, you have to act in accordance with your values. And so at Rick Steves Europe, we consider ourselves teachers first. We teach good and thoughtful travel. As Rick said, and he said a number of times, our job is to teach people how to travel so that one trip becomes a trip of many so that broadened perspective really has that opportunity to take off. We also think we're role models, personally and professionally. I shouldn't say we think we are, we try to act like role models. And that's why we're doing this. No one else is doing something like this. We want to show the world what real ethical role models in the travel business should do. And at the end of the day, we promote humanness. That human to human interaction between people as you travel is the core of everything that we do. And I'll talk about this as we go forward, but that's why our Climate Smart commitment is really aimed at helping farmers do their work really in the developing world while contributing less to climate change. And there's always an educational focus. And in, in those areas, we are educating women and girls on the success of the pro programs. And in the United States, we are lobbying Congress to take action. We truly believe that Congress has to step up and put the US into its leadership role to really ensure climate action takes place. And so we want Congress to hold companies accountable, just like we're holding ourselves accountable. Now, a lot of people will just ask, you know, why do you do it? You know, isn't just climate change and helping or avoiding climate change or mitigating it about planting trees? Well, it's not really about trees, right? The issues of climate change that are happening right now are very complex. And it, I'm going to take some time to show you what those are and how they're impacting uh, the world and namely farmers in the developing world. The first thing we know is that climate change is really hitting the poorest people in the poorest countries the hardest. This is a farmer in Nicaragua. You know, they don't, those countries and those, these people don't have the resources to fight back climate change. They're not a wealthy, you know, Western nation. And so they are being stuck in the middle. But right now, those farmers are the ones who are feeding the world. A lot of the food you find on the supermarket shelves when you go shopping is coming from production from farmers just like this. And the farmers like this are really no different than we are, right? They have a value set that matches ours. They just want to have a great livelihood and provide for their families. They're not asking for handouts. They're not asking for special treatment. They just want to be given a fair shake. This is another farmer from Nicaragua. The issue is, is that farmers are caught in the middle of really the global supply chain. Most of these farmers have a small plot of land. 
And so in order to be successful or supply one of the major food manufacturers, they have to devote all of their land to one commodity crop, and that's called monocropping. And then the farmers and the village band together to produce enough to supply the chain. The trouble is that people like us, frankly, we don't want to pay more for our food. And so there's always a constant push to get commodity prices down. And as a result, these farmers make less and less every year. But like us, we also have the same or they have different rising costs of running their lives. It costs them more every year to run their farm, whether they're buying fertilizer or seeds or whatever it is. And just like us, it costs them more to buy food every year. And there's the statistic on, on the slide that shows you that. And that unstable income, this, this pressure on income, yet rising costs creates an instability that impacts the planet. Because they can't make enough income or really have a real solid livelihood, they can't escape extreme poverty. This is just the floor of what someone's house looks like in one of these villages we're, we're speaking about. In the center of these houses, there is an open pit fire that dominates. And these fires burn all the time. And it's largely burning because they need to boil water. And that, of course, causes a number of issues. First, kids and women are always heading back and forth to the water supply so they can bring water to boil. That keeps kids from school. The second issue, you've got to keep the fire burning. So kids and women are always going back and forth to deforest to bring the, the firewood back. Plus, now the fire's burning all the time, you've got ongoing smoke. And the smoke is an issue by itself. On the right-hand side on this picture, I just wanted to show you what the roof of someone's house looks like. All the tar and the soot and the smoke just hangs in these houses and pollutes where they live. And kids are growing up with bronchitis or emphysema or any number of respiratory diseases caused by smoke, as well as eye issues, because they just can't escape it. On the left-hand side is a latrine, which doesn't look all that uh, sanitary to me to begin with. But the idea is that if that if a storm causes that to leak or overflow, that will contaminate a farmer's land. It will probably make it unable for them to farm, and it could also contaminate the water source. In order to make income, then, the farmers want to improve their lives. They start devoting all of their land. I've said they got a small piece of land, but most farmers might have kept a portion of that to grow their own food. Well, now they know economics 101, right? That says, if I need to make more money, I need to sell more. So to sell more, I have to make more. So they devote every inch of their land to the commodity crop. Other farmers who maybe have some land, you know, depending where they are, they will decide to expand production and they'll expand production by deforestation or some other environmentally damaging way to deforest or they'll give up their culture. They'll move from agriculture over to livestock, say, and livestock farming has a huge impact on the environment. At, if things get so bad, they will migrate. Now, migration causes really two issues, or it comes from two issues, and the first one is kids. Kids growing up in a village where they don't see any future will leave. They'll head for the big cities to seek their fame and fortune, and that will hollow out the villages so there is no continuity of farming. The other issue is if there's really no hope, farmers pack up everything they've got and they leave. Some end up on our borders and become a political talking point, but they leave for other places. But the issue isn't the migration. It's that they wouldn't have left if they had hope in the first place. Other farmers actually get just become victims of illegal land grabs. There are organizations out there, companies out there, as well as gangs, no economics 101 as well. And so they want to produce more to make more money, and they need more land. So they'll just take yours, and they will come in and either illegally deforest rainforest, just illegally expand them, or kick farmers off their land. Farmers don't have legal title to their land in most of the 
most of the places in the world because it's never been set up that way. So they have no legal recourse to get their land back. And then they're forced, if they want to keep a livelihood, to work on the land that used to be theirs at poverty wages in an inhumane living condition. The end result of all of this is that we're losing the wild. The forested areas of our planet are slowly being eroded by urban areas or really food production. And it's we're replacing the lungs of our planet with activities that are just producing carbon and causing climate change. This slide will tell you that food production accounts for 26% of all greenhouse gas emissions yearly. Other people will now say it's up to a third. It also uses 70% of fresh water use yearly because once you deforest and eliminate all the natural barriers when to a place like this picture shows, if you don't keep the water pumped to it to keep it green, it will dry up and blow away. And deforestation is happening at an alarming rate. This is a picture of the illegal deforestation going on in Indonesia. And this is from illegal palm oil plantation expansion. So you've got to think palm oil plantations or palm oil is in over half of all the consumer goods we use in the United States. It's in everything from lipstick to soap, and it's even in ice cream of all things. And so these companies know that if they need to expand production, they can deforest. And a brand is going to buy the product that's produced because we're going to buy it. There's no recourse for the brand or for the palm oil manufacturer because the government in this country probably doesn't care because they're going to get some tax revenue from the sale of the palm oil. Everybody benefits and there's no repercussions. And as I said, it's happening all the time. It's never stopping. This is an example of you know what it looks like after they light it on fire and come through and bulldoze it. The Amazon is on fire. A few years ago, it was headlines that the Amazon's on fire. Well, it still is. And it's burning at an alarming rate. And the end result is not actually helping food production. You'd think all this expansion is saying, oh, hey, now we have all this food, but that's not what's happening. It's actually making our food supply more vulnerable because of all the carbon being emitted and the, and the carbon climate changing results of food production, it's making it unstable. There's a statistic I'll just read because it's on the slide, but it, you know, 50% of land currently used for coffee production won't be suitable for coffee by 2050. And there's nine plant species that account for 66% of global food production. Imagine if we lose one or two of those plant species. Not only what does that do to our food supply, what does that do for all of the farmers around the world who depend on that for their livelihood? At the end of the day, we just think the situation you know, needs to change. Inaction is inhumane. That's who we are at Rick Steves Europe, and that's what we believe. This is a picture of kids in Indonesia walking to school in the smoke and the pollution of, those, of that illegal rainforest deforestation through burning. And really that's why our Climate Smart Commitment has this huge focus on helping farmers. Because at the end of the day, if you're a company that promotes humanness, what is you know, more human than helping farmers who are caught in the middle and really have no choice? And that's why we built it this way. The first thing we're trying to do is really helping these uh, farmers improve their living conditions. So we're bringing in things that will help reduce their impact on the environment and climate change. So this is a picture in Guatemala of uh, water filters being delivered. And so water filters, chemical or charcoal water filters are game changers for these villages. Not only now, this lady, again, this is at a global communities village we uh, help with in Guatemala. You know, kids now don't have to go back and forth to the water supply. They have water security. That gives kids the time to go to school. They don't have to deforest to keep the fire burning. That saves deforestation and stops climate change. On the left-hand side, the little girl bending down, that's in Kenya 
we sank a borehole for, and we now get 40,000 liters of water a day. A borehole is a well, basically, but it's 40,000 liters of water a day, which provides that village with water security. The next step is going to be extending it to create a dam and a reservoir to bring water security to the region and more villages and prevent all that deforestation. On the right-hand side, that's a food for farmers village in Colombia where the girls just wanted to show off their water drinking skills after they got their new water filters. But we do know farmers still have to eat. Right? You can't get rid of fire completely, but what we're doing is making even that more efficient. And so this is in Nicaragua. This lady is with one of our agros villages, but we're putting in climate smart cook stoves. Now the climate smart cook stoves are important because they use less fuel. So even if they have to burn firewood, it's gonna use less firewood, which is less deforestation. And the other part of it is you can see the vent behind her, there's a stainless steel vent, that's now vented outside. So as they as they cook their food, the smoke is now leaving. So it's making their house safer and, you know, re removes the smoke. Here's a lady uh, in Guatemala enjoying her climate smart cook stove. This is a family also in Guatemala, but with global communities. And in this community, we actually gave them bamboo. And bamboo plants are fast growing. And so if they use the bamboo plants for the fuel for the stove, this family might never have to cut down a tree again because of their fast growing bamboo plants. Global Communities also tells us that each one of these stoves saves enough carbon for 30 flights to Europe. Now, once we get through these two issues, which is essentially to stop deforestation, we bring in the trees. So I said it wasn't all about trees. Well, now it is a little bit about trees because it's about reforesting. So if you bring in the right trees at the right time, at the right place, reforesting starts to, re it replenishes what was deforested, brings back the soil and protects the land so that if there's storms, the soil doesn't blow away. And we've been planting a lot of trees. Nearly every one of our projects has a tree planting piece of it because it's so important. And I'll just show you, here's some tree farms that we've been sponsoring over the last four years. This is a tree planting exercise in Kenya where the Zeitz Foundation, since we've started, have germinated over 250,000 trees. And by the time this is over, we're going to germinate and hopefully plant 3 million trees. Literally, that means everything you see on this picture will be reforested with acacia trees to bring it back to what it was before deforestation. And when it's time to reforest, everybody comes out. The villages know how important this is, and everyone comes out to, to participate. They want to bring back their culture, and they want to get back to the lifestyle that they knew before deforestation. In Central America, same thing. This is with the Global Communities of Project in Guatemala. Again, when it's time to reforest, everyone comes out. Because in Central America, they, they tend to say, trees make rain. And they know how important it is to reforest. The other part of reforesting, because you just saw some seedlings, right? The other part of reforesting is picking different kinds of plants. So you can actually, through fruit trees, and other plants, you can do something called intercropping. And intercropping is just a fancy word to say, I'm putting two crops on the same piece of land. And what will happen is the one crop you've planted will help the farmer's food production. So it'll actually make the soil stronger or make the other plants more resilient. So now farmers have a more resilient product. They can produce more, which allows them to make more income without the need to deforest. Fruit trees by themselves, and that's what this lady's carrying, it's fruit trees in Colombia going ready for replanting. Um, fruit trees then of course produce fruit, so that would have a side benefit of giving a farmer a food supply, as well as another income source. They could sell that fruit on the market and help offset that pressure on commodity prices. Um, the other benefit of fruit trees and pollinators are bees. And I think we all know, we've heard stories about bees becoming extinct. This is our opportunity to help bees, but it also brings in honey. And this is the Maya Exil 
which I think I pronounced incorrectly, uh, in Guatemala. It's a co-op, and these farmers are also harvesting honey, and it's producing a secondary income source to help offset the pressure on commodity prices. Then finally, we get the climate smart farming. So everything up till now is about stopping deforestation, uh, really that reforesting, bringing the land back to the way it was. And now it's about directly helping a farmer. And when you talk about directly helping a farmer, it's about climate smart, like hydroponic farming techniques and organic farming. And so this year, this is a gentleman, he's with the Rainforest Alliance uh, in Ghana, showing off his climate smart cacao. If you ever wondered what that looked like, that's what it is. Now, climate smart farming sounds fancy, but it's really not. It's not multi-million dollar investments, right? It's on the left-hand side is your chemical fertilizer farm. In, or sorry, organic fertilizer farm. Whoa, I hate to say that. Organic fertilizer farm. And the idea is if you can start using organic fertilizers, you can break the soil's dependence on chemicals. And really chemical fertilizers turns the soil into a drug addict. And every year it needs more chemicals to produce and the pushers are the chemical companies. And so if you can get the soil off of that with organic fertilizers, it's more money in a farmer's pocket because they're not spending money, but it also makes the product organic which fetches a higher price at market, which is more income and less need to deforest. The other side of this is low drip irrigation. And water saving low drip irrigation is important because it can get you through the dry seasons. This is a picture of what that looks like outside the, the greenhouse. But we know, I mean, we live it here in the United States. Summers are longer, they're hotter, there's these dry spells. And if you're a farmer, that makes it impossible to produce. So if we can help farmers save water and get through a dry season with a harvest, more production, more income, less need to deforest. This is an example of, you could say intercropping or even vertical farming, where if you can plant things horizontally, you can get more on land than if you planted it vertically. And if you plant shade trees up top and a crop underneath, you now have two crops in the same spot. Again, more production, less need to deforest or expand production. This lady's measuring her, pe uh, her pepper, that's in Nicaragua. But the idea is this is now what we can produce out of these techniques. This is pepper production in Nicaragua, and this is a hydroponic lettuce farm in Nicaragua. Both are with an agros project that we've been with for three years. And in these villages now, these farmers have the ability to sell enough product at market to get out of extreme poverty. That means they have enough income that they can pay back their debt, which it is debt because they're entrepreneurs. They, in, they We invite them into the program. We give them a loan, essentially just like any other entrepreneur, and then they have to pay it back. So they pay back the loans and have enough after running their farms to save enough to be out of extreme poverty. So we know it works. The next step is then because hydroponic and, and commodity crop farming is working so well, we extend it to personal farming. And that allows farmers to take some of their land back to personal food production using the exact same techniques and now being able to grow their own food or sell the excess at farmer's markets. This is an all women, all organic farmer's market that Food for Farmers runs in Nicaragua. And it really is, you know, it's not that complex. Home hydroponics is a bucket, a, a pump, and some pipes. And the next thing you know, you've got a hydroponic market, just like a, a hydroponic garden, just like Maria. And she's getting ready to harvest and go to market. And then to make it successful long term and continue this dependence to independence. This is the goal independence. We're educating women and girls to take the lead. The women and girls are the A students. They're the caring people of the, of the society. And if you give them the responsibility to make this a success, you know it's gonna be a success. And so through programs like Food for Farmers Community Promoters, they're teaching these girls how to run the programs. This is Susie in Mexico who teaches farmers about beekeeping. This is another Food for Farmers seminar teaching people and another one how to run these programs. 
This is a community promoter in Mexico who's going to hand off her seedling, but then she'll stay and make sure the reforesting and all of these techniques are working. And so we're giving young people a reason to stay in the villages and make sure farming and these projects survive. And then to get to the next generation, we're funding a lot of smaller projects where kids learn how to do organic farming at school. This is in Bogota, Colombia, where they learn organic farming, grow their own food and take it home and teach their families. This is a food for farmer school who's learning the same thing. This is in Kenya with the Zeitz Foundation where we're gonna build a vocational training academy for really conservation skills. So now generations of girls are gonna learn how to be conservationists so all the work we're doing in restoring biodiversity and helping farmers contribute less to climate change will continue long term. This is another school in Kenya. This is with Beads for Education. And these girls take some of our money to become travelers. So we promote travel to meet people. Now they have a chance to go meet people. And in this case, they went to Mombasa, learned about marine biology, and you can see the plastic in that picture, but they learned about plastic and that blob of plastic in the ocean and the impact on marine life, as well as currents and how that causes climate change. Then they clean it up. And in their off season, when they're not in school, they petition the Kenyan government to take action on climate change. Other women are learning how to fix the climate smart technology so that if it breaks, it will continue. And then we're actually creating new careers. This is a lady in Nicaragua with Agros who got a micro loan and used the money. And a micro loan is like 50, 100 buck loan to get a, start a convenience store. So in a village where three years ago there was no hope, we've now created an entire class of entrepreneur that's going to ensure those villages stay strong. And the end result is that we're giving farmers back their self-determination. And I like to say there's nothing more determined than a little girl, and you can see that in her face. The next step of it, of course, is advocacy. We can't do this all ourselves. I wish we could, but we can't. And so we have to use organizations as paid counterweights to the fossil fuel lobby in Washington, D.C., one of our organizations, we consider lobbying, but they're really guerrilla advocacy. That's Rainforest Action Network. And through PR campaigns, they try to raise awareness of all those brands who are profiting from climate change. And so through PR campaigns and other, other activities, they try to raise awareness of us as consumers to know what's happening so that we will take action with our pocketbook. And they hold rallies around the world to try to show the financial institutions that are profiting from these land grabs and deforestation. Um, the other side of it, we have lobbyists in Washington, DC. Bread for the World and Citizens Climate Lobby are two of our partners in advocacy to go into the halls of Washington and talk to our politicians about climate change and why action needs to be taken. The Citizens Climate Lobby, their philosophy is, the solution to climate change is democracy. So they're out grassroots raising as well as talking to congressmen so that they can teach people just like us to talk to our local politicians or politicians at every any level about climate change and urge them to take action. Now, I get to the end, of course, there's always a lot. Uh, Rick knows I could talk for seven hours about this stuff because I love it. But if you wanna find out more, I'd say come to our website. You know, you can, uh, the link I think is in the chat or in the Q&A, um, but you could Google Rick Steves Climate Smart, you'll find it. You can go to our main page and scroll to the bottom and you'll find a link to Climate Smart Commitment. And all our information is there. It lists all our partners. You know, if you don't know what to do, you can pick one of our partners and donate to them. In hopefully about a month, we'll have the ability for you to donate directly to us. So you can donate to our Climate Smart Commitment if you're traveling and you want to offset your travels in a way, if we're taking care of your air flight, you might want to take care of something else. And so we want to give you that ability. And of course, we want to tell other travel companies to steal our idea. Like this is, this is a cool thing, we think. So take it and run with it because we believe it's ethical and it's really making a difference. And at the end, I just before I turn it back to Rick, I just want to remind everybody, because I've never said this really, but 
every one of the pictures you've seen, except for the ones with Rick on stage and that come from one of the projects we've been involved in since we started. And so if you've traveled with us since 2019, you've made this possible. Our program's a success because of you. And if you're going to travel with us in the future, you'll know that the self-imposed carbon tax relating to your trip is going to continue to make these projects successful and change the world. And so with that, I can hand it back to Rick. Craig, thank you so much. I, I can listen to you forever talk about this. And I, I get the sense that it's been uh, in sort of inspiring for you to be steep on the learning curve and over all of these years that you've been at this, really understanding what a, what a difference we can make. I mean, this is a small, on the, on the big scale of things, you know, a million dollars divided by 10 organizations, but the, but the impact is mind blowing, isn't it? Well, it is. I mean, it's the one thing we've got great partners, you know, and it's the one thing that I've learned through all of this is that the value for money equation that we attach to ourselves in the United States versus what changes, what amount of money will change an entire village's life. If you talk about $1,000 or $5,000, it will completely change the life of one of the, of all of these villagers in a particular place. Oh, and they are smart. I mean, what I kept thinking about as you were talking is how this is not old fashioned, um, um charitable developmental aid that really makes people dependent the whole bottom line here is to enable local people to become independent and in so many cases i think you know we're supporting organizations that are supporting organizations that are really local and they are tuned in to what works locally uh, women get it done you know i mean that's that there's some basic smart policies that really utilizes the money that goes into this much more effectively, aren't there? There are. And I mean, again, our partners know who's on the ground and how to make this yeah. successful. And our commitment to women and girls is really what's motoring yeah. this yeah. long-term success of the program. And I just think of places like Agros and mm -hmm. what we've proven in those three yeah. years, you know, going forward, we haven't announced this yet, but we will in a couple of weeks. You know, we're going to take what we've learned and create a training center so farmers from all around the area can come in and learn these techniques and take them back because mm -hmm. it is, it's about creating independence and not dependence. And Craig, you can't just grab 10 organizations and throw money at them. You've put a lot of effort into finding 10 organizations that have the values we have and are getting what our mission is done. And it's so great to hear you as a, as a listener you're talking about these organizations like you know the people, like they're friends. And you've learned these organizations over time and they really are our friends and, and we're not giving them charity. We're investing in them to do what we would like to have done in the trenches south of the border. Well, that's right. I mean, and I remember when we started this, we talked about it. It's our climate smart portfolio. That's how we look at this. It's an yes. investment in these nonprofits to invest in these communities to get a long-term yeah. return basically no different than we anyone would want from their 401k or mutual fund you know we want to see these mm. ideas pay off and make lives better and i just don't have the bandwidth to, to to put this together and you have done it and all of us at rick steve's europe all hundred of us are so thankful for that and proud of it and when people travel on our tours it is a it's a matter of, it's a kind of a peace of mind, isn't it? To know that you're not a hero. It's just baseline travel ethics. I'm going to fly to Europe and back for my vacation because I'm a lucky person who can do that. We're paying our carbon cost. We're mitigating the bad we create by investing in these organizations to do that much good. Is that a fair summary of what we're doing? I think that's a very good summary of what we're doing. Yeah. God, that's great. And as you were talking, Craig, I kept thinking the value of travel. Uh, we can't all go to Nicaragua and check this out. I was really thankful to take on this project when we made the one hour special on public television, Hunger and Hope, Lessons Learned in Ethiopia and Guatemala. We did that just in the year before COVID hit. And I wrote this little booklet, it's 70 pages, but it really develops a lot of the points that you were making. 
and you can uh, it's a pretty expensive to get this on a pledge drive in public television but you can get it for free at ricksteves.com if you look in the tv section and this is a one hour show you can watch there. But this book is available for free in a PDF form. You can just go to the TV section, look up Hunger and Hope and download it and learn a lot about what Craig was talking about. It is, it is a fascinating area of study, isn't it, Craig? The rudiments of hunger and poverty and you splice into that climate change and climate smart agriculture. It's a fascinating topic to learn. It has been the most rewarding, I would say, the most rewarding activity that I have done in my career. And I am thankful you're doing it as my COO, <laughs> Senior. It's just so great. And I want to remind people that our, the organizations we're supporting for our travelers, it's a fine point, but, I, but Craig and I have really um, been very uh, focused on this. There's lots of reason to help people who are suffering because of climate change. But what we are doing, we're helping people who are farming and contributing to climate change in the poor half of this planet do their work while contributing less to climate change. That's a different thing than helping people suffering because of climate change. And you've been able to find organizations and we've been able to actually redirect a little bit of their priorities with the funding we're able to provide, haven't we? We did. I won't name the person who told us, but remember when we started this, one of our partners was like, that's not how we do it. Yeah. And now three years later, it's like this, this is the yeah. core of all the development work going forward, climate smart agriculture and moving people to depend independence from dependence. Craig, I'm inspired by your work. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm just proud that you and I are going to take this little show on the road. We're going down to Los Angeles next month to the travel festival and uh, good for the travel festival, good for the travel industry to put us on stage and talk to all those people who are going there to learn about travel. They're going to do something that has never been done before. Expose these ideas and you and I are going to do that. So thanks so much, Craig. Thanks, Rick. God, I'm just excited about it. Uh, let's go back to Julianne, and I bet we have a few questions from our from our travelers. We do have some great questions, and I have to say I was inspired by our viewers tonight because they had so many questions, and they were so grateful for this work as well. So thank you to Rick and Craig from our viewers tonight as well. And our first question is from Jessie, and she was wondering, how did you both arrive at this decision, a self-imposed carbon tax, when no other company had done so? Well, both of us, I can speak for, it's actually an interesting question in that Rick and I both came to it at a pretty well exactly the same time. I I really wanted to be able to do something to give back to the environment. And so did Rick. And it just came out of what should we do? Um, you know, we knew that it was really focused on our airplane flights and how to creatively offset that carbon. And that's that's how it started. So. And I would say I am an enthusiastic capitalist and Craig every bit as much as me, but I think we see the government as a necessary referee in order for us not to just focus on short term profits, but sustainable long term profits. And we wish we were taxed for our carbon. So that would be honest accounting, but we don't do it that way because you wouldn't get elected if you told people we're going to tax you for your carbon, apparently. So rather than wait for that to happen, we think it is ethical to tax ourselves for that carbon and invest it in a way that does what our government could be doing. And that's probably why 20% of what we're raising and investing is going to advocacy groups because our government needs to be reminded that they can do uh, the right thing for the planet and for baby Atlas and everybody else's grandchildren. And of course it is $30 per tour member on a Rick Steves tour, but many people were wondering, and you both tapped on this a little bit, but how can independent travelers mitigate their carbon footprints? Well, we did a lot of studying in advance to find out just, is this real? Can you invest $30? And does that really mitigate your carbon by flying from here to Europe and back? And every scientific estimate is yes. The conventional way to do it is just to buy carbon offsets in the first world. Craig and I wanted to make a twofer out of it. We wanted to mitigate that much carbon, but we wanted to help out people in the developing world. So we've got these organizations. You could spend months learning about this as Craig has, 
and find an organization you want to support. Or you could just freeload on Craig's work and look through the portfolio, find one of the organizations that tickles your fancy. That's one of the joys for me and Craig is to be able to support organizations that it's just the angle we like. And Craig, when Craig <laughs> proposes to me these, these amazing little powerhouses of, of, uh, of climate activism, I just love it. And uh, if you're curious about palm oil, if you're curious about a burning rainforest, if you're curious about empowering women to, you know, uh, have access to water so they can treat their land better, whatever, you can find those. And 10 great organizations are right there uh, in Craig's portfolio. So if you got 30 bucks and you want to invest it in this and you want the, free, the peace of mind of knowing you and your family are going carbon neutral, you could just um, take a look at what Craig recommends and help them directly. And as Craig mentioned, we're going to orchestrate that in the future. That's something very exciting that Craig's taken this to the next level by, you know, going through us, through our website to help those <laughs> organizations. But there's no excuse for somebody to say, I don't know where to give my money. There's a lot of good organizations that are doing great stuff. And when Craig and I were in the midst of COVID and we thought, well, we don't have much money. We don't have any income this year. We could not, it would break our hearts, wouldn't it, Craig, to pull the financial wall out, rug out from under these organizations that we had given the money to the year before. So we just decided we're going to stick with them, even though we don't have the the business that would be according to our equation to keep giving them money. And Craig, I think I'm glad we did. Oh, I'm, I couldn't, I, I that just leaves me speechless. I couldn't imagine ah. <laughs> not funding them in, through COVID because everyone was hurt in COVID a lot yeah. of nonprofits far worse than yeah. a lot of other people really. And so, yeah, yeah just to keep those services going and yeah. see the success that we've got by doing it is. Yeah. I'm, I'm so thankful. Craig, Craig's philosophy during hard times of COVID said, well, are the people we're supporting for good reason that are doing great stuff and, and dealing with serious need before COVID hit, well, we may be in tough times, but we're going to spring back and we can help these people get through COVID. So you know, with Craig's leadership, we kept our philanthropy the same, essentially, through COVID, which I'm very proud of and thankful for. And if you would like to find the portfolio of organizations Rick Steve's Europe supports, Ben did post a link to it in the chat, and it will be in the follow-up email tomorrow as well. And, and I would just say, sorry, I'm going to cut you out, Julian. Mm -hmm. If you do decide to donate directly to one of our organizations, make sure you tell them, if you wanted to, that you want it to go to the Rick Steves Climate Smart Commitment because mm -hmm. then your money will make its way to one of the projects that you can read about on the website. Great. And we have time for just one more question tonight. And it is for both of you and Craig, you can go first and then Rick can wrap things up for us. And we saw so many pictures of the people that you're helping with these organizations. Mm -hmm. And what is the success story of the Climate Smart Initiative that has given you hope for our future? Well, the big one for me, I did mention it in the presentation, it is the agros villages that we've, that we've really, what's interesting about agros is they create villages from scratch. They, they get people who really are in extreme poverty and they relocate and they start these villages. And from what we've done with our climate smart agriculture work and helping them build farming, you know, to, to bring three villages out of extreme poverty in three years, get them to have enough savings to be over the global poverty line. Mm -hmm. That that is just unbelievable to me. It, it it's the success story out of many success stories, but that's one that you know, will change the world forever because now we're going to take that same learning from village to village to village and just imagine the impact that we can have as we really start to go from the experimental stage. Will this work to, wow, it works. Let's roll this out and get as many people as we can on it. That that to me still blows me away every every day. So there's so much positive stuff that's going on. The more you learn about it, I think the more excited you get. And uh, <laughs> I'm just turned on right now. Craig, thanks again. Julianne, thank you for moderating. And I do believe right now we have um, a little bit of business to do. We've been uh, enthusing all week about the free tour, right? Yes, we have. 
<laughs> yes, we have. And uh, I just want to remind you that every week we're going to dig into the money belt and pull out a name that's drawn from the virtual bucket and they're going to win a free Wix Steve's tour. And we've got tours to four exciting cities. These are the four cities in Europe that deserve a week. Paris, Rome, London, and what did I, I got it wrong? Paris, Istanbul, yeah. And these are the cities that I just love. And uh, somebody every week is going to win one of these. And um, last week we drew the name out, and that was Spencer. Uh, today we're going to do that, and next week we're going to do it two times. So anybody every week that joins the contest gets the chance to win. And I'm going to, in good budget travel fashion, I'm going to pull out my money belt, if you'll excuse me here. And this is what we travelers like to wear when we don't want to get ripped off. It's our money belt. And in my money belt, I've got the winner. So I'll tuck my money belt back away. And I'm going to reveal the winner of this week's free tour. It's right here. And the winner who gets a free Rick Steves one week tour, taken any time in the next two years, must be over 100 departures to London, Paris, Rome, or Istanbul. And I'd love to talk with you if you're sorting through which one of those is better. Who do we have? Sharon Benson of Lakewood, Colorado. Ha <laughs> ha! Sharon, congratulations. Man, oh man, that is exciting. I hope you're excited. I hope you're watching. But anyways, we'll get in touch with you and we will celebrate your free tour on Rick Steve's bus. All right. Hey, tomorrow we're going to France. Right now, I just want to thank you all for watching. Wish you happy travels. And I hope we've given you some food for thought as we turn our trips into smooth, affordable, and ethical reality. Happy travels. <laughs>